Hi, my name is Ian Wen, and I'm the product manager at Promochrome Technologies. Thank you for joining my presentation on how to automate the solid phase extraction of UCMR5 PFAS compounds. Here's a quick outline of this presentation. I will be first giving an overview of UCMR5 and the associated PFAS testing methods. This is followed by highlighting the extraction procedure before going into the considerations of automating the process using our eight-channel SPEO3 system. Finally, methods 533 and 537.1 results will be discussed with comparisons drawn between the SPEO3 and vacuum manifold. UCMR5, as you're probably familiar with, will be using EPA method 537.1 and 533 to monitor 29 PFAS compounds in drinking water. By determining the occurrence of these contaminants in more than 10,000 public water systems, together with health studies, the EPA can then make informed decisions on regulation. Extensive testing calls for the participation of numerous labs. As of June, there are 34 labs that are approved for PFAS testing under UCMR5. The sampling period will take place between 2023 and 2025, and data reporting is due to complete in 2026. Here's a quick comparison of EPA methods 533 and 537.1. 533 uses weak anion exchange with isotope dilution. 537.1 does not use isotope dilution and employs reverse phase SPE. The two methods share a list of 14 analytes ranging from C4 to C12 carboxylic acid and sulfonic acids. Gen X and Adana are also included as they are industrial replacements for PFOA. EPA method 533 brings to the table an additional eight short chain compounds and three foil telomer acids, which are precursors to other PFAS compounds. EPA method 537.1 covers two more sulfon amino acidic acids and two long chain carboxylic acids. Even though these methods employ different extraction chemistry, they share many similarities in the extraction steps. The cartridge conditioning stage involves activating the sorbent with methanol followed by other reagents. According to the methods, care must be taken to ensure that the sorbent does not go dry. As a result, each cartridge usually has to be conditioned individually if done by hand. Once the cartridge is conditioned, 250 ml of samples are then loaded at 5 ml per minute for method 533 and 10 to 50 ml per minute following method 537.1. Flow control is especially important for weak anion exchange, and we have seen improvements in fluorotelomer and long chain recoveries at reduced flow rates. Again, the method mandates that the sorbent should not go dry. After loading, each sample bottle is rinsed using reagents, and the rinse state is delivered through the SP cartridges. This is followed by five minutes of nitrogen drying. For the final elution, the sample bottles are first rinsed with 2% basic methanol for 533 and pure methanol for 537.1. And then the rinse state is used to elute the cartridges in a dropwise fashion. This is done twice, and the collected fraction is later evaporated and reconstituted to one mil before loading onto the LCM SMS. As you can see, the extraction involves many handling steps and with special requirements for making sure that the sorbent doesn't go dry. Manual extraction is going to require full attention, especially when more samples are involved. A fully automated solution can therefore not only free up lab personnel and ensure that all steps are performed correctly. The similarities in procedure and solvents used mean that both methods can be performed on the same automated extractor as long as it has five or more solvent lines. Compared to manual extraction, the SPEO3 is designed to achieve better flow control, automatic bottle rinsing, and higher resistance to cartridge clogging. These pictures are both taken at the Orange County Water District, who has been using the SPEO3s for both methods 537.1 and 533. As you can see, the automated systems are also quite compact. Next, I'll go through the considerations for achieving this automated solution. This section will be somewhat similar to my other presentation on automating SP for different methods and matrices. So if you've already seen it, feel free to skip on. Uh, conventionally, liquid handling systems require one pump and a couple of switching valves per channel. So if you scale that up to a multi-channel system to meet the throughput requirements of most PFAS laboratories, you start running into uh, limitations in space and cost. At Promochrome, we invested a lot of R&D to achieve the handling of eight samples using just one multi-channel valve and two syringe pumps. This has drastically reduced the complexity and size of our systems while offering high efficiency. With this design, tubing is also kept minimal, 
so that it's easy to clean and not necessary to prime the lines. With the low reporting limits for PFAS, we want to minimize any components that could contribute to the background. As such, we implemented a minimal Teflon option that replaces all our PTFE lines. We also replaced our Teflon valve order with PEAK. However, our job doesn't stop here because we were set up to achieve full automation. PFAS extraction typically involves multiple bottle rinsing steps due to the sticky nature of long chain compounds. Many labs see this as a key consideration when exploring automation. Bottle rinsing is performed by spraying solvent into the bottles, which are mounted upside down. With this feature, there's no need for the user to come back in the middle of the run. PFAS extraction typically involves multiple bottle rinsing steps due to the sticky nature of long chain compounds. Many labs see this as a key consideration when looking into automation. The picture here shows our setup for 250 ml bottles used for 533 and 537.1. Bottle rinsing is performed by spraying solvent upwards into the bottles, which are mounted upside down. With this feature, there's no need for the user to come back in the middle of the run to rinse each bottle. In 2020, we introduced built-in resonators for shaking the sample bottles. I extracted a clip from our Method 1633 video to show you how it works. There's no sound, but the shaking is quite vigorous to increase the bottle rinse coverage, especially if you're using rectangular bottles. As seen from the video, it also removes water droplets and sample residue from the bottle walls. And lastly, I want to bring up that flow control is absolutely essential in achieving good recoveries using SPE. However, it's a challenge when you're using one shared vacuum source because any variation in samples or cartridge packing will lead to uneven flow. Oftentimes, the operator has to be around to observe and make adjustments. Cartridge clogging is also an issue on vacuum manifold, especially when it comes to samples with particulates. It really jeopardizes the efficiency of a laboratory when select samples are loading slower than others. Our design uses positive pressure syringe pumps to provide uniform flow across all samples. The sorbents also remain wet by default. Therefore, there's no need for the operator to be around to make flow adjustments. It also guarantees that each extraction is completed in a fixed amount of time. Our latest pump design can deliver more than 30 times the pressure of a typical 25-inch mercury vacuum pump across eight channels. So they're also much more resistant to cartridge clogging. In the following sections, I will be discussing method 533 results in detail, including detection limits, background, accuracy, and precision. Alpha Analytical from Massachusetts have been very generous to share with us their field extraction data on both the SPEO3 and vacuum manifold. Their SPEO3 was configured with the Mod004 sample bottle rinsing feature and Mod005 minimal tap on option. All extractions were performed using Phenomenex wax cartridges. Sykes 4500 triple quad and Action LC UHPLC were used for the analysis. As required by the method, each sample batch includes four QC samples alongside a maximum of 20 field samples. This allows us to look at various aspects of the extraction performance. I should also mention that the positions are rotated on the automated and manual systems between each extraction batch. The lab reagent blank LRB is used to assess system background. It is free of the target analytes and only contains the 19 labeled compounds of the method. The lab fortified blanks LFBs contain both the 25 analytes and 19 labeled compounds, spiked at low, mid, and high concentrations. This allows us to measure recoveries and reproducibility. In my other presentation on different matrices, I compared the labeled recoveries of field samples to the LFBs to determine how sample matrices affect the accuracy. If you're interested, uh, you may check out the other video recording. Between each extraction on the SPO3, a 15-minute automatic cleaning cycle is run to remove carryover. So this is what method 533 looks like on the SPEO3 system. If you look from left to right, each step involves selecting the action to perform and then choosing one of the six solvents or your sample as the inlet. Flow rate and volume are then defined based on your method requirements. After starting the run, it takes just under two hours to complete all eight samples without any intervention. The duration is mostly determined by the volume and flow rate requirements of the method. Now let's dive into the data. A set of one nanogram per liter spikes were run on the SPO3 prior to the field extractions to determine the detection limit, MDL. The table shows the measured concentrations of all 25 analytes across eight positions. If you look at the last column highlighted in gray, most of the compounds have their MDLs well below one nanogram per liter. 
62 FTS is the only exception that came close to one nanogram per liter. Alpha analytical shows the reporting level to be two nanograms per liter. EPA method 533 requires blank levels to fall below one third of the MRL, which equates to 0 0.67 nanograms per liter in this case. If you recall, each field extraction batch contains a lab reagent blank. So here's looking at the average blank results of seven field extractions using the vacuum manifold. Uh, the reason why I'm showing the manual extraction results first is to give you a baseline of how much contamination to expect. All the compounds came out to be under the limit, even though some traces were picked up. Comparing the blank results on the SPO3, you can see that similar compounds were present. Based on these numbers and our experience, the contamination is likely coming from outside of the extraction systems. Moving on to recoveries and accuracy, these are the manual extraction results across LFBs taken from eight extraction batches. They include two low spikes at two nanograms per liter, four mid spikes at 40 nanograms per liter, and two high spikes at 160 nanograms per liter. Method limits are between 70% to 130%, and you can see that even with manual extraction, the numbers fell pretty well within that range, between 90% to 120%. Now, if you compare that with the SPO3, the recoveries are even tighter across the board, between 95% to 110%. These are well within the method limits. With the controlled flow rate and thorough bottle rinsing, we do expect optimal recoveries using the SPEO3. Here are the relative standard deviations for the LFBs extracted on the SPEO3. As a reminder, the LFBs were extracted across different sample batches, dates, analyte concentrations, extractor positions, and lab personnel factors that come to play when your lab is running real samples. Even then, the RSDs are pretty much all under 15% using the SPEO3. Moving on to method 537.1, I would like to thank the Orange County Water District for sharing their data. Their lab employs some of the best practices such as tracking the average QC data over time. As such, we're able to look at the LFBs and LRBs across 19 extraction batches on the SPEO3 and vacuum manifold. Their SPO3 was also configured with Mod004 sample bottle rinsing feature and Mod005 minimal Teflon option. All extractions were performed using Phenomenex SDBL cartridges with SDVB packing material. SIAC 6500 plus triple pot and Agilent 1216 Infinity HPLC was used for analysis. Here's the built-in EPA method 537.1 on the SPO3. It's quite similar to method 533, but uses a faster sample loading speed of 10 mils per minute. The extraction time for eight samples is only 75 minutes. The minimum reporting level, MRL, was determined by extracting seven of uh, two nanogram per liter lab spikes on the SPEO3. This is performed by three different lab personnel over a span of three days. The method mandates that the prediction interval of result, PIR, has to be between 50% to 150%, as shown by the dotted lines. PIR refers to the average recovery plus minus the half range. The plot here shows the average recoveries using the light blue bars and the upper and lower PIR using the orange lines. All recoveries at this low level were between 92% to 112% and the PIRs were between 70% to 128%. So the lab can confidently go with two nanograms per liter as their MRL. The background requirement for the method is once again a third of the MRL, which comes to 0.67 nanograms per liter, as shown by the dotted line. The plot shows the lab reagent blank LRB measurements across 19 extractions. I know it looks like the data has gone missing, but both the manual and SPO3 extractions have pretty much undetectable background. When we check with them what it means by zero background, they estimate it to be in a noise range of around 0.01 nanograms per liter. If you manage to notice the tiny orange bars for PFTA and PFTRDA, um, those are just from a single manual extraction that had about 0.2 nanograms per liter of background, which is still far from the limits. Now let's see how the manual and automated systems performed over time. This graph looks at the two PPT LFBs across 19 field extraction batches between the manifold and the SPO3. The bars represent recoveries, whereas the lines at the bottom represent standard deviation. 2 PPT is their reporting level, so the limits are 50% to 150% in this case. As you can see, both manual and SPO3 extractions yielded similar results well within this range. 
Average recoveries were between 88% to 105% on the SPO3 and 90% to 108% on the manifold. The RSDs are also comparable and below 20% for both, even at this low level. Again, these are all done on separate dates by different lab personnel. Method 537.1 requires the rotation of QC spikes between low, mid, and high levels. So here are the results of their 50 PPT LFBs over 19 extractions. And the recovery still fell comfortably between the tighter 70% to 130% limit. The RSDs are again similar and well below 20% for both approaches. I've shared this slide at my other presentation as well, uh, but I believe it's applicable to drinking water samples because even drinking water labs come across samples that contain particulates or suspended material. For these cases, uh, we provide high capacity inline filters to prevent SP cartridge clogging and to protect the moving parts on the SPEO3. The picture on the left shows how they're mounted beneath the sample bottles. Uh, these filters are pre-pass free and the fact that they're inline means that all samples pass through them as they're extracted. During the bottle rinsing steps, the solvent washes through the inline filters to recover any trapped analytes. The Orange County Water District ran a performance check using four spikes at 20 nanograms per liter and saw good recoveries between 87% to 109% and RSD less than 8.5%. To summarize, the SPEO3 helps to improve the efficiency of PFAS extraction. The fully automated system requires no attendance after pushing start and even performs the bottle rinsing steps. Based on the method prescription, it takes just under two hours for eight samples following EPA method 533 and only 75 minutes for eight samples following method 537.1. Combined with the quick cleaning cycle between extractions, it is possible to run three extractions in an eight hour shift. This constitutes the magic number of 24, which includes a batch of 20 field samples and four QC samples. Typically, labs would run back to back extractions while the extracts are evaporated in the background. With up to six solvent lines and adaptability with different sample containers, the SPO3 can support a range of PFAS methods, including 533, 537.1, Draft 1633, ISO 21675, and other in-house methods. The compact footprint allows the extractor to easily fit in fume hoods or on crowded bench tops. As shown in this presentation, the recoveries and consistency on the SPO3 exceeds the UCMR5 method requirements. The minimal Teflon option and simple design also minimizes any PFAS contamination and carryover. By using our inline filters, the SPO3 can even handle samples with particulates. I would like to thank Alpha Analytical and the Orange County Water District for sharing the data with us, and of course the NEMC organizers and volunteers for taking time out of their busy schedule to make every year's conference a huge success. At this time, feel free to forward any questions to my email um, and please do check out our PFAS application page for more information.